so much for coming here today. Yeah, that's nice to have you in my show. I'm still back Oh, really? Yeah, one stop. We are very spoiled. Yeah, that's a question. Because of the young generation, two more young journalists. It's, it's, it's <laughs> You're all very jealous. <laughs> yeah. Based on the situation, I'm here, right? But I didn't know anything. I don't want to make something from myself. But as long as I'm here, journalists contact me. I know that how many journalists left Afghanistan, how many left behind in Afghanistan. What is the. Uh, uh, National communities in the United States and allies responsible now to for them that still live behind in Afghanistan. Those things. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you. What time should I call you? Maybe 9 10. Okay, thank you. I send it to my boy, obviously. There it is. Yeah. And then I bring it to my son.
answer. Yeah, I just did it. Because you know, I asked him this specifically. Was, yeah, I can answer it. Yes. So it's still fine. Yeah. Good, how are you? Hey, good to see you. Yeah, you too. How's going? It's going well, how about you? Nice. I like your dress. Thank you. in particular that even the mention that the better mentioned that it's called Kukorina. That one has been under attacks and the Kurdish authorities started like moving some of the troops close to the area. So they have stopped a couple activities but they just can't do much. It's like very cheap rockets and that is really really important. It's 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 working with some you squeezed in yeah. everything. It's and it's very good for physical health. Honestly, I never expected it. I got it because I'm very lazy. They show it. That's what they do. I mean, yeah, Iran and Korea. Yeah, yeah. My source is <coughs> Colombian journals that in Britain you can fix that there. I did tell him not to fix it too much. I did those things that I stopped and said, like, what way about that? Because I was a post for something. I was like, you're like, no, I'm working with my agents. Yeah, that was good. Yeah, I appreciate you. Yeah. And you see, I, I don't expect this to be like this. I think it would be impossible. Have to respond, but they do have to respond in a way that you know. Yesterday, even just like we're all at the senior level. No, you're not. The the, the Iraq desk or the Iran desk. They're just like and most of the stuff they do is through their embassy, right? Like it's just like that is one of the things that we need to do. Actually, that letter is. But then like, you have like the Turkish the Turkish um, army. Yeah. 
from English and Kurdish article. So whatever they say, just throw it in there. If they don't respond, no idea. You don't respond. This idea is the other side of the action. I should write an article. Thanks. All right. <laughs> باشه به من بریفینگ اون خارج هم هست شروع نشده بعد یه ممکنه که مثلا اینجوری ده دقیقه زودتر نیام دیگه مثلا یه پنج دقیقه زودتر بیام جلو دوربین فیلم بردارم اونجا آمده است آره ببینم شاید بشه تو این فرصت سوالم بپرسم ببینیم چه جوری میشه <تصفيق> ممکنه کلا همیشه بهش پستایی بکنم خواهی بزنیم بکنم Um, I just got a comment because it's not open for us yet. Oh, uh -huh. did it have a heads up or anything? Yeah, I 
have you late all of Good afternoon. I've uh, actually come empty-handed today, so I am uh, I am at your disposal. I say that with only mild trepidation. So, uh, Matt, I turn it over to you. Right. Thank you. Uh, let's start with Iran. Um, so, presumably, you've had a chance to take a look at the uh, respond their response to the uh, EU pact. Uh, what, what do you make of it? Well, some of you have heard this from us already today, but uh, we have in fact received Iran's comments on the EU's proposed final text. Uh, we have received them through the EU. Uh, we're in the process of studying them. Uh, we are at the same time engaged in consultations with the EU and our European allies uh, on the way ahead. All throughout this process, uh, from its earliest days, we've taken a deliberate, we've taken a principled approach uh, to the negotiations with the remaining JCPOA participants. Uh, and more recently, uh, since this deal has essentially been on the table since March, uh, we've known what a final deal on mutual return to compliance with the JCPOA uh, would look like. Uh, and I made this point yesterday, but it, it bears repeating. We agree with the high representative. We agree with uh, Mr. Uh, Burrell's fundamental point. Uh, what could be negotiated over the course of these past 16, 17 months uh, has been uh, negotiated. So we'll continue to study uh, what has been submitted. We'll continue to uh, consult closely with the EU, with our uh, European allies, other uh, partners. And when we have more to say, we'll share that. Okay. Well, I mean, when you say what could be negotiated has been negotiated, that would suggest that this is it, that, that um, if Iran doesn't say yes, Unreservedly, this text where it's dead. Well, I, this will be up to the EU as the mediator and the arbiter, arbiter to have uh, a say um, on on that question. But I will make the point that uh, these are not simple issues. Uh, these are uh, not issues uh, that can be uh, entertained or tabled um, uh, with. Um, without, for example, the consultations that we've had with the EU over uh, the past several weeks, uh, where the parties have had an opportunity to ask questions of the coordinator, to seek additional clarity, to seek additional information. Uh, and that's just because of the very complex uh, and by, de by definition complicated uh, nature of the issues that are on the table. So, uh, but, but if what could be negotiated has already been negotiated, that by definition imply that there is nothing left to negotiate. And if Iran wants to reopen any part of this, there are a lot. Broadly speaking, we agree with uh, Mr. Burrell. Yeah, but what, uh, and what does that mean? That what, what, what could be negotiated has been negotiated. Does that mean that it there means is that nothing there, there, there's no opportunity, no room for any further negotiation? It means that we have spent the past 16 months or so. Uh, since the spring of 2021, uh, going over in exhausting detail uh, through a process that 
uh, has gone on in our estimation for uh, far too long, far longer than it needs to have gone on. Uh, we have gone over the big issues, uh, the issues that are at the core of the two key questions that we sought to define answers to uh, starting in the spring of last year. On the one hand, uh, the steps that Iran would need to take to resume its compliance with the JCPOA, that is to say the steps that Iran would need to take uh, to once again reimpose the verifiable, the permanent limits on its nuclear program. And on the other hand, uh, the steps that the United States would need to be prepared uh, to take in terms of uh, sanctions relief on Iran's nuclear program if Iran uh, agreed to that proposition. So the, the, the big issues have been discussed. Uh, they have been tabled. Uh, we believe uh, they have been uh, largely settled. That was the point of well, the largely EU. Largely settled this is not the same as what could be negotiated, has been negotiated. So it's a simple yes or no question. You know, there's a simple yes or no answer to this, I think, unless there's not. I mean, unless there is there. something more that you are willing to talk with the Iranians about. Has everything, is this the final offer? Is there nothing that can be changed about it? Is there anything left to, that you're willing to negotiate? Well, this is the agreement, this is the text that the EU has put on the table uh, that is substantially based on a uh, deal that has been on the table for uh, several months now. Uh, but again, these are complex issues. These are not an uncomplicated, uh, this is not an uncomplicated set uh, of business. Uh, and so over the course of the past several weeks, for example, uh, we have had an opportunity, all parties have had an opportunity to pose clarifying questions, to elicit additional details. Uh, so I am not prepared to um, today offer any precise information on the details of the text that uh, the European Union has put forward, the coordinator has put forward. Some of these questions uh, are better directed at uh, the European Union itself. For our part, uh, we are reviewing the response that Iran provided to the EU, uh, that in turn was provided to us. Uh, just as we've said, we've been conveying our feedback privately uh, to the EU. We'll continue to do, to do that, but we're not going to uh, detail that feedback. Last one. Is there anything that Iran is looking for now that you think falls outside the scope of the JCPOA? In uh, other words, that there are, there were at the beginning, what you would call extraneous issues that they wanted to uh, resolve. Are there any extraneous issues left? And whether there are or not, is there anything that Iran is still looking for that the administration believes that it cannot? Oh, to answer that question, Matt, would uh, require me to violate the cardinal rule uh, mm -hmm. of speaking to the text that is on the table or uh, the Iranian response that has been provided to the EU and in turn provided to us. That's just not something uh, that I'm in a position to do today. But our message, uh, I think, has been loud and clear. Uh, it has been uh, heard uh, by the Iranians uh, that this <clears throat> negotiation is about one thing and about one thing only. It's about the four corners uh, of the JCPOA, which is focused exclusively on Iran's nuclear program, what Iran uh, is permitted to do, and in turn, what it is required to do to demonstrate to the international community, including to international weapons inspectors, uh, that it has permanent, verifiable uh, limits in place on the extent of its nuclear program. Yes. Um, you are not going to give us any details about the text or Iran's suggestions, but you always talked about being serious. You were always saying U.S. is very serious, and you were asking Iranian to be uh, to show seriousness. Knowing what is in Iran's latest and final suggestions, do you evaluate that Iranian side? Is serious now? Can you tell us at least that one? I, I don't want to prejudge that. I don't want to offer a definitive answer in large part uh, because we are still studying it. Uh, it will require some time to digest what has been provided to the EU and in turn what has been provided uh, to us. Uh, but it is our hope that as we've now approached what should be uh, the final stage of this, that the Iranians will show, demonstrate that serious seriousness of purpose uh, that we have not consistently seen until now. I made the point uh, just a moment ago, but we started this process in the spring of 2021. Uh, it is now nearly late summer of 2022. 
uh, if all sides, if the Iranians had, show, had demonstrated a seriousness of purpose uh, from the earliest days of this, we would have been able to achieve a mutual return to compliance with the JCPOA in relatively short order. It would have taken some time precisely because these are not um, simple issues. There are some challenging technical details that would need to be worked out. Uh, but there was no reason that we should be speaking uh, to uh, where we are uh, today on August 16th of 2022. Uh, but again, uh, as for what has been submitted within the past uh, 12 or so hours, uh, it's something we're taking a very close look at so, when, when we have additional details. To are share you with taking you. any deadlines at the moment to submit your final answer? Uh, the European Union, the coordinator, has been very clear about uh, their expectations. We're not going to speak to those expectations, but uh, we have been conveying our feedback regularly and consistently uh, and privately to the EU. Yeah, I yes. just want to follow on something that you said. And so you were actually prepared to go back to the deal back when you started it. If, we, if this whole starting with, uh, it's really the responsibility of the Iranians. They have responsibility for not arriving at this deal as early as 16 months ago. We would not have embarked down this very long, this very windy, this very uncertain road. Uh, were we were we not were we not prepared uh, from the earliest days to resume compliance with the JCPOA? Uh, it wasn't uh, even after January 20th where we made that clear uh, on the campaign trail. Then candidate Biden uh, made clear uh, that he would seek the proposition of a mutual return to compliance with the JCPOA. We made that clear during the transition uh, between administrations, uh, and we made that clear very early on uh, after the inauguration. Then you repeatedly said that the, Iranian, the Iranians kept adding extraneous demands or whatever they are. But this seems, at least you know, by all reports, by all accounts, that Iran has dropped, let's say, the demand for the lifting of the revolution regard of the terror list, the demand guarantee beyond this administration and so on, for future administrations and so on. So what, what is there left? I mean, are you more optimistic Today, after looking at what the Iranians have offered uh, their deal and the offering in the next few days, we don't, and I've, we've said this before, we don't approach this uh, through the lens or uh, with a pessimistic view or with an optimistic view, uh, in part because the stakes of this. Uh, we have to be clear eyed uh, precisely because of the stakes of this. This is uh, a central challenge. There would be no greater challenge uh, to our foreign policy, to our national security, uh, to the collective security of the international community should Iran uh, acquire a nuclear weapon. And so that is why we have maintained uh, this clear-eyed, steady, principled, uh, pragmatic focus uh, on, at every turn uh, of this diplomacy. Uh, when it comes to the FTO, uh, the president Similarly, has been clear on that. Uh, the FTO designations and other sanctions on the, J on the IRGC are beyond the scope uh, of the JCPOA. We've made that point uh, repeatedly. That is certainly an extraneous issue. But uh, again, not going to uh, detail uh, what precisely we've seen in our uh, study so far uh, of the Iranian response. My, la my last uh, question on, I, I, are you expected to face opposition here at home, you know, with, with the the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, with you know Senator Menendez, Senator McCartney, uh, and others. What if you arrive at a deal with the Iranians? Do you expect opposition? Here? Well, right now it's a hypothetical, uh, so I, I wouldn't want to entertain a hypothetical. I also wouldn't want to speak for uh, lawmakers, who of course are going to voice their opinions uh, once uh, they see what, if anything, uh, results from uh, this process. So not going to. Uh, prejudge that. What I will say is that throughout this, uh, we have engaged uh, regularly on an iterative basis with uh, members of Congress, with their staffs, uh, to make sure that they uh, were apprised of uh, the status of our efforts in Vienna, the status of our efforts uh, in Doha, uh, the status of our efforts uh, with our allies and partners in Europe, the status of our efforts uh, with our partners in the Gulf. Uh, so we have kept them regularly, uh, and of course our, our, our partners in Israel. Uh, so we have kept them uh, regularly updated uh, on the progress. We'll continue to do that regardless of uh, the, the next uh, turn of this process. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is, though, uh, that 
the JCPOA, uh, to our minds, and uh, this is a point that we have reiterated uh, in our briefings uh, with members of Congress, uh, remains the most effective means by which to contain on a permanent and verifiable basis Iran's nuclear program. This is no longer a thought experiment. Uh, a couple years ago, a few years ago, uh, one could, um, on a, at least a, a reasonable basis, uh, make the claim that um, there is a more effective means by which uh, to contain Iran's nuclear program. At that time, it was a, it was a thought experiment. Uh, if you uh, distance yourself from the JCPOA uh, through other uh, diplomatic and uh, various uh, coercive means, uh, you might be able to contain uh, Iran's nuclear program. There at least uh, was a theory for a while. It was uh, the predominant theory within the last administration. Uh, I think the past several years, since May of 2018, uh, have borne out the results uh, of what is no longer a thought experiment. Uh, we've seen a world in which there is a JCPOA. We are living in a world in which there is not a JCPOA. I think most uh, observers uh, would like to get back to a point where Iran's breakout time is not uh, dangerously low, uh, where we are not talking about uh, weeks or less, where we're talking about months, uh, a world in which we once again uh, have verifiable uh, permanent limits on Iran's uh, nuclear program uh, with the uh, various um, uh, inspections and, and monitoring regimes uh, that allow international weapons inspectors from the IAEA uh, to verify uh, that Iran is in compliance uh, with the JCPOA, and more importantly, uh, that Iran is not um, uh, pursuing a nuclear weapon. Uh, we don't have that now. That is what we want. It is in our interests. It's in the interests uh, of our partners in Europe. It's in the interests of our Israeli partners, our partners in the Gulf, uh, and our partners around the world. Uh, anything else on Iran? Yes, uh, uh, yes Daphne and Nagita. Uh, I know you said you're regularly in touch with the EU on the response, but at what point do you expect that you'll have a formal response? And is there any discussion on Americans held in Iran amid all of this? So on your second question, uh, we have continued to convey very clearly uh, the priority we attach to uh, the safety, uh, the security, and ultimately the safe return uh, of uh, the Americans who are wrongfully, unjustly uh, detained uh, in Iran. In fact, today we're marking uh, another somber milestone. Uh, we're marking the 250th, 2,500th, uh, thank you, uh, day in detention for Siamak Namazi, uh, someone who, of course, has been uh, wrongfully detained uh, for years. The same is true uh, for his father, for other Americans. Uh, those efforts are ongoing. We've been clear throughout that we're not um, tying the fates of American citizens uh, to the fate of a proposition, namely a mutual return to compliance with the JCPOA. Uh, that is far from certain. Uh, because a mutual return to compliance has always been uh, far from certain as a possibility, uh, we want the return of our Americans uh, to be uh, a certainty. And so uh, we've been careful not to tie these things directly uh, together, but we have continued to, through every channel and through every uh, avenue, uh, to make clear the priority we attach to this and to seek to make uh, progress uh, on that. Uh, remind me of your first question. Uh, I'm just not in a point to, um, uh, to offer uh, any prediction at the moment. What I can say with certainty uh, is that we'll continue to convey our feedback to the EU. Uh, yes, Gita. Um, actually, my question was about is about the dual citizens and with the um, case of Sia McNamara being this 2,500th day in detention. When you say that the U.S. is uh, not tying their fate to the JCPOA, why hasn't there been any movement uh, progress in that regard, getting them released? How does this work? Does the U.S. administration make the first move, ask for, I don't know, a, a discussion uh, has Iran turned down any recent proposals to to sit and talk about them? Well, in the first instance, that's a question that's much better directed towards Tehran. Uh, after all, it's Tehran; it's the Iranian regime that has wrongfully held uh, these Americans, these dual nationals, these other third country nationals uh, for mm. 
uh, in some cases, years uh, on an unjustifiable basis. Uh, were it up to us, uh, these Americans would uh, have been home a long time ago. Um, so I couldn't speak uh, to the uh, thinking uh, that uh, may be ongoing in, in Tehran, but uh, we have been clear that in our estimation, these individuals are being held wrongfully, they're being held unjustly, uh, they are being held as political pawns, presumably uh, on the part of the Iranian regime to, in an effort to seek to exact uh, leverage or uh, some other concession. Uh, it is a practice that is abhorrent. Uh, it is a practice that uh, we condemn anywhere and everywhere it takes place. Uh, it is a practice that together with our allies and partners around the world, uh, we are seeking to establish and ultimately uh, to reinforce uh, a norm against this practice and a norm that would require uh, the international community to speak with one voice, uh, to stand up uh, in a united way uh, against this practice and to hold accountable uh, those countries who would violate what should be uh, an inviolable rule, uh, that human beings are not pawns, that individuals should not be wrongfully held uh, for political gain, financial concessions, uh, or for other unjust reason reasons. Uh, unfortunately, it's a practice that uh, we see uh, in far too many places around the world. So why hasn't there been any movement? Have, have, when was the last time, off the top of your head, that the U.S. tried to get talks in this regard going? Well, I, I will say a couple things. Um, one, as you know, we have not uh, been in direct discussions with the Iranian regime. That has not uh, been our choice. Uh, we have said across uh, a range of issues, including the nuclear issue, uh, that it would be more effective were we in a position to engage directly uh, with Tehran so that we could uh, table and discuss these complex issues uh, directly uh, without having to go through third parties. Uh, the same would be true for the Americans and the dual nationals uh, who Iran holds unjustly. Uh, we would like to have uh, these discussions uh, in a, uh, through a means by which that is more direct uh, and more effective. But despite the obstacles uh, that the regime has put up, uh, we have made very clear uh, the priority we attach to their uh, prompt return. It is not something that um, we uh, say one month, put aside for several months. This has been uh, an ongoing, uh, consistent effort on our part to convey that message very clearly uh, to the Iranian regime. Uh, anything else on Iran before yes, we move on? Iran, please. Iran, sure. uh, I know you won't, you don't want to talk about their response and your response, but what was leaked so far that they are asking for guarantees? Are you willing to give them these guarantees, or are you able to give them these guarantees? And I have also a follow up, please. So again, I, I am not going to weigh in on what has been reported about an Iranian response that hasn't been made public. Uh, what we've said, this goes back to last year, uh, and you heard from uh, President Biden and some of his colleagues uh, in the, on the margins of the G20 last year, uh, when President Biden met in Rome uh, with our uh, E3, uh, with his E3 counterparts. Uh, there was a joint statement that emanated from that meeting uh, that made very clear uh, that uh, the United States uh, sought to resume mutual compliance with the JCPOA, uh, and we would maintain that compliance with the JCPOA uh, as long as Iran uh, did the same. Uh, but when it comes to other asks that the uh, regime may or may not have made, uh, that's just not something I can weigh in on. My second question, you, you said that you've been saying this for a long time, that you believe that it is the best way to prevent Iran from having any care. We've not, we're not there, uh, and we, we've been in this situation for uh, three, two years now. Is the current step more beneficial for the U.S. than in, uh, enforcing your sanctions? Sorry, repeat the last is part. Is the current statute that we that we are here we are in a statute now? Is more is it more beneficial for the U.S. than enforcing your sanctions since you're not able to revive the deal? Well, two successive administrations now, to count ours as well, uh, has enforced and levied sanctions uh, uh, against Iran. Uh, unfortunately, during that time, Iran's breakout time has only grown shorter and shorter. Uh, so uh, if 
the option were between the status quo uh, and the status quo namely being a position uh, in which Iran's breakout time could be measured uh, in weeks or uh, even shorter periods versus uh, what we would be able to accrue on the basis of a deal that would be substantially similar uh, to the proposal that was finalized in March, uh, we would prefer uh, to have those permanent verifiable uh, limits and uh, that uh, verification and monitoring regime reimposed on Iran so that that breakout time ex once again <coughs> extends uh, so that it's measured uh, in months. Uh, I think the, the past several years has uh, very clearly uh, underscored the limitations uh, that come with uh, sanctions and sanctions alone. The last administration pursued a path of so-called maximum pressure, the fatal flaw uh, of that maximum pressure regime is that the world uh, was not united. Uh, it was um, the United, State, uh, United States on one side of the table uh, and the rest of the world, uh, including Iran in some ways, on the opposite side of the table. Well, it wasn't uh, the entire world. It was, it was much of the international community. Uh, since the earliest days of this administration, we have focused uh, on once again restoring that unity among our European allies with partners uh, in the Middle East to include Israel, to include uh, our Gulf partners as well. Uh, and with that unity restored, uh, we have been more effective uh, in imposing costs and consequences on Iran. Uh, but even those costs and consequences uh, have not been able to uh, stall in a, uh, in a meaningful way uh, Iran's nuclear advancements. Uh, so we want to see Iran's breakout time extended. We want to see uh, permanent verifiable restrictions uh, reimposed on Iran, and we want to see uh, that verification and monitoring regime once again. We will not reach to a point that you will say that the, uh, the deal is dead. The, the deal will be dead uh, as soon as it is uh, no longer in our national security interests to pursue. Uh, the point I just made in that admittedly uh, long-winded answer to you uh, is that the deal that has been on the table, at least, referring to the deal that's been on the table since March, for us is a much more advantageous proposition than the status quo. Yeah, well, uh, one more on a, a couple more on Iran, and then it's we'll move on. And neighbor, Iran's neighbor, <laughs> and then we'll Iran, Iraq, and then Afghanistan. Yeah, one more, I, I yeah. promise we will get to Afghanistan. Yes. Thank you so much. There's one more caveat here, which is the recent attacks against U.S. persons and U.S. citizens. Uh, since the ball is on your court, and not to dig into hypotheticals, but if the investigations indeed prove that Iran was behind recent attacks against uh, Russia or uh, other nations and others. Will that impact your response to recent There's There are ongoing investigations uh, in certain cases, but uh, there are some things that we already know. Uh, and the fundamental uh, fact, what we have known, uh, what we have always been clear-eyed about, is that uh, Iran is a malign influence. Uh, Iran has malign influence in the region, uh, and uh, Iran's malign influence uh, in some ways extends uh, well beyond uh, the region. Uh, but in many ways, that is at the core of our desire uh, to see Iran's nuclear program limited uh, in verifiable and permanent ways. Uh, again, Iran would act with far greater impunity, would feel uh, the ability, I should say, to act with far greater impunity uh, if it had uh, what it could conceive as the shield of a nuclear weapons program. Uh, we are committed. President Biden has made a solemn commitment uh, that Iran will never obtain a nuclear weapon. That, in its own right, uh, is something that um, uh, redounds to our uh, national security. But uh, it also uh, would deprive Iran of the sense of impunity, greater sense of impunity it would otherwise uh, feel. Every challenge we face with Iran, uh, whether it is its support for proxies, its support for terrorist groups, its ballistic missiles program, uh, its uh, malign uh, cyber activities. Every single one of those uh, would be more difficult to confront uh, were Iran to have uh, a nuclear weapons weapons, weapons program. Uh, Iraq. Anything yeah, else on Iran? Yeah. One more? Okay. Just sorry, not to beat a dead horse here, but I mean, it's been almost 500 days since these talks started. It's a little couple days less, I guess. Um, you've said repeatedly and other administration officials that there are a few weeks 
the way from having the capability to uh, to their nuclear weapons breakout capability. I mean, several of your allies directly impacted in the region, Gulf, Israel, have voiced you know, opposition to to the deal. Um, you know, at home, there's bipartisan, significant bipartisan opposition to the deal. You've mentioned the administration believes this is still in, in uh, the U.S. best national security interest, but I mean, to be fair, these are congressmen, congresswomen, members of, of Senate that are also, that have access to these classified briefings that you guys are um, providing them with, and they're still not convinced. And so when you have all this opposition, I mean, does the administration see that everybody, everybody else opposed to this uh, is, is wrong and you guys are right, first? And second, can the advances that Iran has made over these years, be it as a result of previous administration or the current policy, can any of these be reversed if a deal is in fact reached in these next couple of days or weeks? Uh, so you put forward a number of premises. Uh, I would uh, challenge several of them, but I'll, I'll start with this one. Uh, a number of our partners who were, uh, to put it mildly, uh, not wild about uh, the JCPOA in 2015 and 2016 uh, have over the years changed their tune uh, on the JCPOA. Uh, I would point to our partners in the Gulf. Uh, Special Envoy Mali has had a number of engagements with our with our Gulf partners. Uh, the Secretary uh, has convened the GCC. Of course, President Biden uh, recently attended a meeting uh, of the GCC at the leaders level. Uh, and in recent months, we've seen in uh, formal statements uh, emanate from our Gulf partners their support for our efforts to achieve a mutual return to compliance with the JCPOA. Uh, and they support it. Uh, not because it's a foreign policy goal of, of this administration. Uh, they support it for the same reason that we're pursuing it, uh, because it is in our national security interest. It's in turn in their national security interest to see to it uh, that Iran is not able to obtain a nuclear uh, weapon. Uh, we've seen senior officials uh, within Israel, including its security establishment, uh, make a very similar case uh, that it was a disastrous decision on the part of the last administration to walk away uh, from the JCPOA and to make the case that uh, the JCPOA uh, is now the best alternative uh, to uh, the specter of an Iranian uh, nuclear weapon. Uh, to your question on uh, the various viewpoints we, we have here at home, look, it, it is not for me to speak to uh, what we've heard from members of Congress or what we might hear. Uh, from members of Congress, in part because it's a hypothetical. Uh, we don't have a deal. We may not get one. Uh, if we do arrive at one, we'll let uh, members of Congress uh, form their own, own opinions. It is our responsibility to provide them uh, with updates on the status of those discussions, to provide them with updates on the status of Iran's nuclear advancements, precisely what Iran has been able to do since the last administration abandoned uh, the JCPOA. Much of that is classified. Some of that is not. Uh, and the part that is unclassified is well known to all of you in this room, and I've said it already a couple times. Uh, what, what, what once was a breakout time that could be measured in a year has now dwindled down to a breakout time that can be measured uh, in weeks or less. Uh, the uh, various underlying technical assessments are uh, in some ways just as, al as alarming. And I think you have heard uh, members of Congress emerge from some of these briefings uh, and make public statements uh, pointing to uh, the concern that they have owing to the advancements that Iran has been able to make uh, in its nuclear uh, program. So all throughout, uh, we have um, made very clear that we believe the best alternative uh, to the status quo and certainly to the specter of an Iranian nuclear uh, weapon is the JCPOA. There's always been, uh, in some ways, an open invitation for anyone who thinks that there is a better approach uh, to offer that approach. Uh, but consistently what we hear uh, mm -hmm. is the approach that has been tried uh, since May of 2018 and that has demonstrably failed. Uh, this goes back to the point I made before. It's no longer a thought experiment. What would happen uh, if we abandoned the JCPOA and tried a, a, an approach of so-called maximum pressure uh, or if we mounted sanctions? Um, we've tried that uh, and we see the results. Uh, this not go to the plan B that is already, you know, and I guess it should be in the back pocket. It's it's something that we've days. it's something that we've discussed uh, with our allies and partners to a great extent. Uh, we absolutely uh, will resort to that uh, if the JCPOA 
uh, proves not to be viable if we get to a point where uh, the deal that is on the table is not in our national security interest. So I know you're just spinning our wheels here. Right? You, you, you talked about the, the countries that were quote unquote not wild about the JCPOA in 2015, 2014, 2015 having changed their tune. Mm -hmm. Really? Uh, the Israeli security establishment and the and the members of the call in the GCC. Um, sorry, where 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 have they come out and support? I, I can point you to a public security. statement that emanated from Rob Malley's uh, engagement with the GCC. Can uh, you I believe point it was me last to year. A statement from former Prime Minister Bennett or I, current Prime I Minister said, Lapid in uh, support of this. Can you point me, to Matt? A but statement that's not what I said. GCC that's not what I said. From any member of the GCC, that is more than the tepid acceptance of the JCPO in 20, JCPOA in 2015 than they offered when they were really opposed and they just kind of said went along with it as a favor to President, uh, to then -president, President Obama. Uh, I'll, I'll let their statement speak for so itself. The Israeli really security establishment, the Obama administration cited similar, like, oh, behind the scenes, uh, the, the Israelis really think this is a great deal. But the Prime Minister, the Israeli Prime Minister at the time, was vehemently opposed to it. I don't, I, I'm not sure that I, you said the Israeli the elected leadership of I Israel. Didn't, I didn't say that, though. I didn't say that. Well, you're, you're trying to, you said the countries that were not wild about no, it. No, I, I said. Uh, changed I, their tune. I, I was. And in fact, they haven't changed their tune. The Israeli government is still opposed to it. And the, the Saudis, the Emiratis, and the other uh, countries of the Gulf, while they may have said, eh, okay, the, the, the I'm, same, not, I'm not sure those are the, the precise same, words that are, that are in their statement. but tepid, lukewarm. Uh, uh, support that they offered well, back, I, in, I, back in 2015. I, I will, not, don't try to, to well, make it seem you're, like you're putting words in, your, in the world is in support of this. You're putting words in my mouth that I didn't say in terms of pointing to specific uh, leaders. Of course, I did not say that. Uh, and you have acknowledged that there uh, are statements out there from uh, our GCC partners. So we'll leave that there. Uh, Iraq. Iraq. Although, Iraq. Although, although, in all fairness, all the GCC countries seem to be you know, buddying up to you and trying to reinvigorate uh, diplomatic yeah. relations and so yes, on, overtly so. and covertly. You know, so, so you know, the Kuwaiti ambassador just you know turned in his, uh, I guess, uh, papers to to the Raisi and so on. So we see a lot of diplomatic mo mo movement. Maybe they are doing it on their own. Perhaps. We see we see efforts. The way we see it, these are efforts to de-escalate tensions in the region. But our Gulf partners know. Uh, that there would be uh, uh, nothing uh, would de-escalate tensions um, the way that uh, an Iran that is permanently and verifiably barred uh, from obtaining a nuclear weapon would. Yes. Iraq. Iraq. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so I Can I follow up uh, uh, Iran one more time, please? Yes. Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, Iran and North Korea, they cooperate nuclear programs. Uh, Iran also exported their technologies to North Korea. How did you assess Iran and North Korea's cooperation with Ukraine? Well, we've released information on this. Some of this information has been reported publicly as well. It's concerning uh, to see uh, two of uh, the most acute proliferation threats the world uh, faces. The DPRK, a regime that uh, has, of course, already a nuclear weapons program. Uh, and Iran, uh, a regime that has advanced its nuclear weapons program in a way, excuse me, its nuclear program in a way that uh, is of concern uh, to us. Uh, so any cooperation uh, between um, countries that have consistently uh, and um, unapologetically flouted uh, multiple UN Security Council resolutions, uh, the um, uh, international norms, uh, uh, who have engaged in malign and malicious behavior, uh, both in their respective regions and around the world, uh, that's of course a concern to us. Well, one more in Ru Russia, uh, Russian foreign ministry officers who recently met with the North Korean ambassador to Russia announced that Russia will send North Korean constructor workers to reconstruction project in the Donetsk and the Luhansk regions. My question is, the war is still going on. <laughs> Can Russia decide on its own reconstruction project? Donetsk and Luhansk uh, are within the sovereign uh, territory of the country of Ukraine. Uh, 
Uh, it is up to uh, the government of Ukraine. It's up to the people of Ukraine uh, to determine uh, the individuals who should be uh, there taking part in reconstruction projects, not any other countries. Iraq. On Iraq, I want to revisit a question that I asked yesterday about the letter from the Foreign Relations uh, Committee in the Senate. Uh, they do ask the Secretary of State to urgently engage the Kurdistan regional government and Iraqi government to resolve the oil um, and gas dispute there. Do you guys see the same kind of urgency and what prevents you from uh, engaging with those governments? Just busy or is there something else that prevents you from engaging? So not in a position to speak to any congressional correspondence. That's just a, a rule we have as a, um, as a, as a rule of thumb. Uh, but we have been, uh, and we encourage the parties to determine a way forward that supports existing and future investment and advances the interests of the Iraqi people, uh, including those of the Kurdistan region. Uh, we maintain, uh, to your question, a robust formal and informal dialogue with the Iraqi government to improve bilateral trade, to increase transparency, to counter corruption, to encourage economic reforms, to level uh, the uh, playing field for U.S. companies as well. And with that support, U.S. companies have been successful in competing for aviation, for energy, uh, and agricultural, agricultural deals worth uh, billions of dollars. So we have been engaging with uh, the central government in Baghdad. We have been engaging uh, with our partners in the Kurdistan region as well. But the, the, the engagement that you, you've had, does it... The, the letter, going back to the letter, does kind of indicate that the, the interest or, or the investment of U.S. companies is also being jeopardized by this dispute between Baghdad and, uh, and the people. Uh, obviously, the engagement that you've had so far hasn't really helped with solving those disputes. Do you, do you share the same concern on, on the investment that you have over $300 million in energy sector? Well, any disputes between Baghdad and Erbil would be disputes between Baghdad and Erbil. Uh, we can, play, of course, play a role uh, to encourage dialogue, to encourage uh, the central government, to encourage uh, Kurdish uh, uh, government officials to resolve uh, those disputes in a way that is constructive and effective, uh, and that's what we've sought to do. Uh, we have a number of interests when it comes to Iraq. Uh, we have a number of interests when it comes to specifically uh, within uh, uh, Kurdish territory as well. Uh, any dispute between Baghdad and Erbil has the potential uh, to set back uh, those interests and interests that we often do share uh, with the people of Iraq and the Kurdish people as well. So we hope and to see them resolved. One more. Uh, the, the letter also does say that uh, senators believe that the Iraqi oil ministry is applying the recent Supreme Court's ruling selectively on U.S. companies. Is that something that you guys share that view? I, I'm not in a position to confirm those allegations, but uh, we have an interest around the world, and this, of course, includes uh, in Iraq and seeing a level playing field for American companies. We believe in competition, uh, but we believe that competition has to take place uh, with rules of the road, rules of the game that are clearly defined in a level in a playing field uh, that is very clearly uh, level. Whenever we see that uh, not the case, uh, we seek to engage to, to correct that. But that is the question, though. Do you see in Iraq as being a level playing field for U.S. companies? Uh, again, U.S. companies have been in a position to win contracts worth billions of dollars. Uh, we have been engaging with our Iraqi partners, with our Kurdish partners, uh, to make sure that that, level, that, that playing field uh, is level. Nazira. Thank you very much. Three questions. I'm surprised. One is that Tom West uh, recently has said that United States will not support the Afghan Central Bank anytime soon. What does that mean for Afghan economy? This is the first question. The second question is Afghan people still uh, live behind in Afghanistan after uh, Iman al-Zawairi's killed. Uh, do you think that U.S. and Afghanistan relationship with the Taliban is still the same? Is still Afghan people can leave Afghanistan? And also, there are so many singer, Afghan singer, the Taliban destroyed their equipment. They tried to leave Afghanistan. They would like to know about U.S. Uh, policy and U.S. new program about. Great. Uh, so, on your first question, um, I just want to be very clear that uh, the preservation of the three point five billion dollars in Afghan uh, central bank reserves; uh, those funds were preserved for the benefit of the Afghan people. Uh, what we are focused on right now 
uh, are the ongoing efforts to enable those funds, the three and a half billion dollars uh, in licensed Afghan central bank reserves, uh, to be used for the benefit of the Afghan people. And we're seeking to find the best mechanism to ensure that those funds can go to the Afghan people uh, in a way that doesn't risk their diversion uh, from the Taliban or uh, other forces, um, including to uh, potentially uh, terrorist uh, groups or terrorist actors. Uh, the point Tom West uh, was making is that owing for the risks I just alluded to, uh, we do not see recapitalization of the Afghan Central Bank as a near-term, as a near-term option. Uh, we've engaged Afghan technocrats uh, with the central bank for many months regarding uh, measures to enhance the country's macroeconomic stability, uh, but we don't at the present believe that institution, the Afghan Central Bank, has the safeguards and monitoring in place uh, to manage uh, these, uh, this level of assets responsibly. Uh, and needless to say, to your second question, uh, the Taliban sheltering of uh, now deceased Al-Qaeda Al -Qaeda leader Ayman al-Zawahri uh, reinforces the deep concerns we have regarding uh, the potential risk of diversion uh, of funds to terrorist groups. So these discussions are ongoing. We want to see these funds uh, into the hands, into the pockets of the Afghan people as quickly and effectively um, as we can manage. Uh, and we're continuing to, uh, to work with uh, international partners uh, to devise a way to do that. Uh, on your second question regarding our relationship with the Taliban, there's no question. Um, well, let me stipulate. Uh, we have uh, reason to believe, very good reason to believe, that uh, members of the Haqqani Taliban network were witting uh, of Ayman al-Zawahri's presence uh, in, Ka in Kabul. Uh, certain members of this network took steps uh, to actively shelter him, of course. Uh, that is going to have implications for our engagement with the Taliban. I just alluded to uh, one of them. We're not uh, dismissing that, far from it, uh, as we think about potential options for uh, the $3.5 billion in licensed uh, Afghan reserves. Uh, but we're thinking through any potential broader implications for our engagement with the Taliban. And we're doing that for a very simple reason. We've always said uh, that our relationship with the Taliban will be predicated on the Taliban's uh, ability or willingness to, compl to comply with the commitments that the Taliban has made uh, to the international community, to the United States, but most importantly, to the people of Afghanistan. Uh, and there are areas where very clearly uh, the Taliban has been unable or unwilling to comply with those commitments. Counterterrorism uh, has been uh, one of them. And the fact that the Taliban members of the Haqqani Taliban network uh, we're witting of and actively sheltering Zawahiri, uh, I think is a, an egregious uh, violation, uh, not only of those commitments that the Taliban has made, but the underlying U.S.-Taliban uh, agreement. Uh, the fact that the Taliban has um, failed to stand up for, to protect uh, the rights of all of the people of Afghanistan, uh, the, especially the women, the girls, the religious minorities, uh, ethnic minorities. That, of course, is a failure uh, on the part of uh, the Taliban as well. The fact that the Taliban has failed to put together a, 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 a government that represents uh, the Afghan people in all of its diversity, uh, that is a failure. Uh, so we are taking a close look at all of these considerations that, of course, uh, will have implications for our engagement uh, with the Taliban. Uh, when it comes to Afghanistan's uh, culture uh, and uh, the singers uh, that you referenced, um, there are uh, a number of, uh, well, one, uh, we are doing everything we can uh, to protect uh, and to uh, reinforce the rights of the people of Afghanistan who remain in Afghanistan. And in every engagement we have with the Taliban, human rights is at the very top of that agenda. And that includes, of course, the human rights of women, of girls, uh, of Afghanistan's uh, minorities. Our humanitarian assistance is part and parcel of this. We've continued to lead the world in the level of humanitarian funding that we provided directly to the Afghan people, more than three quarters of a billion dollars. Uh, since September of last year, we provided 150, announced 150 million some odd dollars uh, alone just last week, an additional uh, assistance for the people of Afghanistan. So we'll continue to stand by them 
uh, as a humanitarian uh, donor and the world's largest humanitarian donor. Uh, there are uh, some individuals, however, uh, who may seek to depart uh, Afghanistan. That, by the way, is another one of the commitments that the Taliban has made, the commitment to safe passage, uh, to allow those who wish to depart the country uh, the ability uh, to transit freely, to depart uh, freely. Um, we have uh, also stressed that uh, with the Taliban. Uh, there are a number of avenues that individuals like the ones you mentioned, uh, singers, uh, other um, cultural icons, uh, could seek to pursue uh, to, to leave the country. Uh, there, of course, is the P1, so-called P1 um, uh, category within the U.S. Refugee Admissions Program uh, that uh, individuals um, such as those could uh, pursue. But our goal is to protect and to promote the rights of all Afghans who remain in Afghanistan uh, and to continue uh, in our efforts to facilitate the departure uh, of those who, who wish to leave. Now, Thank you. On the $3.5 billion, Thank you. your answers to this and other people's answers to this seem to suggest that there was a point over the, in the past year after the withdrawal that recapitalization of the, of, of the bank with this money uh, was a serious consideration. Is that... Is that correct? Matt, I, I think that owes to the fact that uh, when we're talking about Afghan central bank funds, on paper at least, uh, the most effective means by which to reinfuse these funds back into the Afghan economy would be to recapitalize the Afghan okay. central bank so if when, that's where when, they... When did, when, when did that stop becoming a, a, we, a realistic we've, thing? When, when you got the intel about El Salvador? We've, we've, uh, we've had these discussions with Afghan te technocrats over... Uh, a matter of months, not going to detail exactly. Okay. Well, so you're saying that in fact there was a serious, there was no, I'm not, I'm not, being given to I'm not, I'm not, that I'm not saying that. Central I'm, bank I'm saying that we've, I'm saying that we've, we've looked at all. When was it? When, when, when was it that it was a possibility that you could actually, that you would actually send this money to the Afghan central I'm, bank? Matt, what I've said is that we've looked at all plausible options. Uh, there are some options on paper uh, that may seem far more attractive than they would well, when, in practice. When was, it, when was it an option? If you're saying it's not an option now, I'd just like to know when, because I'm not sure that it ever was a realistic option. Uh, again, and just, I don't think it was ever really again, I'm seriously just, considered. I'm not, going, I'm not going to detail the right. private conversations we've had with Afghan tech Secondly, yeah. I, I, and I apologize, I should have mentioned this press office earlier, but do you have any kind of update on the status of the Afghan refugees who are in Kosovo now, who were sent there to get vetted? I mean, originally it was both the Kosovar said, you know, you can have a year. To, well, it's been extended, I believe. But what what's going on with them? And if you don't have the answer, if someone could get, we'll we'll see if there's any more information to provide. But the last I checked, there's a small number uh, that is still there who are undergoing uh, additional uh, vetting. We've been able to clear. Uh, uh, a, a number of them uh, already, but again, each vetting process is done on a case-by-case -case basis, um, and, and that's ongoing for those who remain there. Can we do uh, Turkey, yeah, please? Uh, yes, and yes. Um, quickly on the uh, Afghans still looking to apply for SIVs, um, is there any consideration to open up new so-called lily pad sites um, beyond the ones that, for example, at UAE, you've got several thousand of Afghans who are still waiting for um, to be processed with the SIV application. Um, so the lily pads is the first question. And then secondly, is it um, correct to say that the IOM contract in the UAE expires in September? Um, uh, therefore, it would go back to normal US consulate processing of visas and that UAE site for processing visas for Afghans will no longer be there from September? Uh, so for the specifics of the uh, IOM contract, um, uh, I would need to refer you to, to IOM for that. Um, if we have anything to share, we, we can. Uh, but uh, to your broader question, um, we have taken a number of steps, as I detailed in some, um, uh, in some detail uh, yesterday, uh, to uh, expedite uh, the SIV uh, processing. This is, uh, these are steps that started uh, almost as soon as this administration uh, set foot in office, uh, and you look at the metrics um, that we've been able to achieve, you see that progress reflected. And I'll give you just one. Uh, between January 1st of 2021 and June 30th of 2022, uh, the average processing time for the chief of mission uh, review has decreased from 883 days to 82 days. Wait, that my is question more than was tenfold. just if that would be, if 
if there will be consideration in the future for more lily pad sites to be opened up to help process the Afghans who are still in Afghanistan so to my, leave the country. My understanding at the moment is that lily pad sites are not a limit, limiting factor uh, in terms of the number of Af Afghan SIVs uh, that we are in a position to process. Uh, as we have announced uh, on several occasions now, we're always looking at the totality of that process, a process that was defined uh, by Congress uh, involving multiple departments and agencies to see if there are ways uh, that we can streamline that, either within the Department of State or by working with our interagency partners. Uh, if there are, we will pursue that. And I think uh, that fact is borne out um, by, the, uh, by the very idea that we've been able to cut that processing time um, by uh, more than a tenth, by more than tenfold. Uh, let me move around. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, so the Turkish Defense Ministry confirmed today that they are moving forward with the second regiment of S-400s. I realize the contract had previously been signed, but that is still a deliberate decision on their part to move forward with that. On top of that, Russia is saying that um, they've also reached an agreement to localize production of certain components of the S-400 within Turkey. I'm wondering if I could get a reaction to both those developments. And does that change the Biden administration's willingness to move forward with the F-16 deal with Turkey? Thank you. Uh, well, number one, my understanding is that these reports emerged in uh, TASS. Uh, yes, but the Turkish Defense Ministry has said that at least the uh, second regiment of S-400s will be coming in response to that, even though it wasn't a new contract that they signed. So um, I think there is is some at least some question or complexity uh, uh, regarding this issue. Um, we've seen these reports that first uh, emerged in TASS. Uh, we're not aware of any new developments on this matter. Uh, our position on Turkey's purchase of the S-400 uh, is well known. Uh, we'd refer you to the Turkish government to speak to their defense procurement plans. Uh, but you know the point we have consistently made uh, across the board is that Russia's brutal and unjustified war against Ukraine uh, makes it vital now more than ever in some ways uh, that all countries avoid transactions uh, with Russia's defense sector. Uh, it puts them at risk uh, of sanctions. But assuming they move forward with the second regiment of the S-400, which they have said they will, that doesn't change the calculus on the F-16 sale? Well, of course, we'll, we'll have to wait and see uh, what happens, but uh, we're not aware of any new developments uh, on this matter. Uh, and so would refer you to uh, Turkish authorities uh, for the time being to spend to speak to their plans. Uh, uh, let me move around, Shannon. Sorry, just to go back to the uh, Afghan Central Bank funds. The last conversation the department had on releasing those or potentially releasing those funds, developing a mechanism, happened in between the authorization of the strike that killed Zawahiri and the strike actually happening. Just wondering if you could explain that timeline a little bit more. Uh, are you referring to Tom West's engagement in Tashkent? Yes, on July 27th. Uh, so Tom West did meet in Tashkent. That was the last face-to-face -face, uh, engagement uh, with the Taliban that we've uh, had since the strike on Zawahiri. Uh, of course, at the time, the strike on Zawahiri had not taken place. You can understand, uh, I think, the um, secrecy um, with which those impending plans were held uh, within the U.S. government. It's not something that uh, we discussed with the Taliban, uh, of course, uh, beforehand. But in the aftermath of that strike, and as um, the presence of Zawahiri uh, became known within Kabul, the fact that senior members of the Kani Taliban network were witting of it uh, and actively sheltered him, that, of course, has featured uh, into our thinking. We're still considering the implications of that. Uh, and it reinforces the idea that the Taliban uh, heretofore has not been willing or able uh, to comply with the commitments it's made to its own people. Uh, yes. Yeah, on China, um, after Speaker Pelosi's visit, China fired five missiles into Japan's exclusive economic zone uh, and claimed that there was no Japanese EEZ uh, that was recognized by China because Japan had failed to negotiate with boundaries. Does the U.S. have a reaction to China's statement about that? Um, and does the U.S. believe that China's actions were a violation of the U.N. Convention on the Law of the Sea? I, I will defer to our Japanese allies. I know they have uh, made clear that several of those ballistic missiles fell uh, uh, in close proximity uh, to their territory. Uh, the point that we have made is that our commitment to the defense of our allies in the Indo-Pacific and around the world is ironclad. Uh, we have uh, a commitment and uh, we uh, all will be unwavering uh, in standing with our Japanese allies in the face of 
uh, intimidation or potential threats. Can I put us on here? I'm tired. We're on China issues. In China, recently, we that the sanctions on the seven U.S. delegates after uh, Speaker Pelosi's visit to Taiwan. Can you verify their names? What is who is the seven delegate? That's a question for Beijing. It's not a question for us. Uh, any reaction uh, to the peaceful visit uh, of a member of Congress, in this case, uh, the Speaker of the House, uh, any reaction along those lines is an overreaction. Uh, as we've said, uh, members of Congress have every right uh, to visit Taiwan. Members of Congress have done so for decades. A previous Speaker of the House uh, has visited uh, Taiwan. Congressional delegations uh, have been to Taiwan many times this year, more than 10 times uh, this year. But does that mean now that you're ready to say that their response to the marking delegation visit is also an overreaction? Matt, I'm, I'm not sure th that Beijing has made very clear that this is our response to the speaker, this is our response to Representative no, I mean, Markey. They, they so to, far, far be it from me to, I, I will leave it to uh, you know, Beijing to speak to its response. Yesterday, uh, Chinese government said that they also, they, uh, all of the sanctions already, uh, Pelosi's families, relatives, but this is an additional one yesterday. So I think the State Department verified this case. Name of. You cannot verify it. We are not in a position to verify sanctions that other countries have imposed on Americans. Uh, it would be the responsibility uh, of those countries uh, to detail any targets who may be sanctioned under their own authorities. Uh, I, yes. Yes, uh, thanks. Uh, moving on to another continent, Africa. Two questions. Um, one, what is the U.S. Uh, reaction to the elections in Kenya, which uh, the president-elect and it's contested by the challenger, and the situation is uh, pretty troublesome. Uh, and do you have any direct contacts with the Kenyans at some level uh, on this issue? Uh, have you conveyed any uh, concerns of what happened? And then the second question, uh, unrelated, is Mali. Uh, the French troops, uh, the last French troops just left uh, Mali. And uh, as everyone knows, the situation in the whole Sahel is uh, pretty bad in the Islamic State. Um, I know there are talks, there's a presence and all that, but is the US willing to substantially step up its presence and implication in the Sahel? It's a general question. Uh, to your first question on Kenya, the Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission chair uh, yesterday, of course, declared that William Ruto, uh, as the winner of the Kenyan presidential election, uh, going forward, uh, we urge all parties to work together to peacefully resolve any remaining concerns about the election through the existing dispute resolution mechanisms. Uh, and we ask all political party leaders to continue to urge their supporters to remain peaceful and to refrain from violence uh, during the electoral process. Our embassy in Nairobi has been in regular contact with their counterparts uh, in the Kenyan government, primarily to underscore uh, that core message, that core message of calm and patience. Secretary Blinken spoke to uh, President Kenyatta uh, on Sunday. He uh, spoke to him for two primary reasons. One was to provide him a debrief of the secretary's travel uh, in South Africa and the DRC and Rwanda as well. Uh, but also to underscore uh, the importance of calm and patience uh, as the electoral process continues within Kenya. Uh, so we will continue to be in close touch with our Kenyan partners, uh, and we hope to see that calm and patience uh, prevail. When it comes to Mali and the Sahel more broadly, uh, our approach um, to the region is one that recognizes that there are a number of shared threats uh, that emanate from uh, the Sahel. Uh, including the threat of violent extremism, the threat of terrorism uh, from uh, groups that have been able to take advantage uh, of the vacuum that has emerged uh, within um, uh, Mali and uh, within the region more broadly uh, in recent years. Uh, we deeply appreciate uh, the cooperation and um, the coordination uh, we've been able to achieve with our French partners uh, we made very clear, we've made very clear that uh, we value uh, the role that they uh, have played in the region, uh, that uh, cooperation, that coordination role will uh, continue. And we see uh, the value of working 
uh, by, with, and through uh, partners. That includes uh, partners on the ground where applicable, but also uh, our partners and allies uh, more broadly. And of course, over the years, we've worked very closely uh, with France on matters pertaining uh, to the Sahel, and I expect that will continue. I'll take a couple final questions, Abby. Can you share the latest on U.S. communication with the Japanese government on uh, incarcerated American Lieutenant Rangel Khanis? Um, is U.S. Ambassador Rahm Emanuel engaged in those efforts? And do you believe these were super clear crimes? Well, this was uh, a tragic event uh, that resulted in the loss of two precious lives. It's caused a tremendous heartache. Uh, for all involved. We're continuing to monitor the situation with the Department of Defense and uh, our embassy in Tokyo uh, to explore all options for finding a successful resolution that is consistent with U.S. law, uh, with Japanese law, as well as with existing treaties. To your question, Ambassador Emanuel uh, has spoken with the Elkanis family. He's spoken with members of Congress, uh, with his U.S. military counterparts, and uh, with Japanese government officials. Uh, Department of State officials here in Washington have also been in touch with uh, their Japanese counterparts uh, at the Japanese embassy here, and the embassy uh, in Tokyo is coordinating with the Department of Defense to provide all appropriate assistance. Uh, anyone? Um, sorry. Sure, I want to ask you about the Palestinian issue. I mean, there's so much that's happened, but that would respect my question to, to the issue of the human rights. You know, last year, the Human Rights uh, Council of the United Nations established a, uh, an ongoing international commission of inquiry. Uh, it looks into Israeli abuses, Catholic abuses. I mean, one does not know where to begin. They issued a letter where they basically, they blasted you and the Israelis for constantly being in the way of having a real substantive investigation of Israel's human rights abuses in Palestinians. And my question to you, when will the United States put its weight behind a real investigation of human rights abuses by Israel against the Palestinians? Uh, Saeed, you know that we stand for, stand up for human rights around the world. Uh, but in this case, we do oppose the open-ended, biased commission of inquiry uh, that targets Israel uh, and only Israel. Uh, we made that clear upon the release of the commission of inquiry's report earlier this year. Uh, we made that clear upon the creation of the commission uh, last year as well. Uh, we approach uh, this situation in Israel and Gaza with a clear focus, one of de-escalation uh, and one of uh, providing humanitarian relief, especially to those who so desperately need it, uh, in, especially in Gaza. Uh, in all of our efforts, we're committed to working with other members of the international community over the longer term to create the conditions uh, for a lasting and sustainable peace. Uh, we'll support actions in the UN that bring the parties together and promote peace and stability. Uh, our issue has been that the Commission of Inquiry does not do that. As I said, it is biased, it is one-sided. Uh, Israel is the only standing agenda item on, uh, at the Human Rights Commission. Uh, it's why we have uh, opposed uh, this Commission of Inquiry uh, and uh, the Human Rights uh, Committee's uh, undue focus uh, on Israel. So if they had countries like Rwanda and maybe some other places, or, you know, Brunei or whatever, you would be fine with that? We would want to see uh, that any effort is done in a way that is unbiased, that is untarnished uh, by politics, uh, and that is really at the heart of the mandate of uh, the Human Rights Committee. Uh, there is a reason we re we first re-engaged with and later rejoined uh, the HRC, because we believe that the promise that the HRC has uh, is tremendous. Uh, when at its best, uh, it can be a defender, it can be a promoter of human rights uh, around the world. I think everyone in this room, however, knows that the Human Rights uh, Committee has rarely uh, lived, up, lived up to that promise. Uh, one of the reasons why we are back uh, on the committee is to do all we can to use our influence with our allies and partners uh, to see to it that uh, its agenda uh, is appropriate, to see to it uh, that its efforts are uh, unbiased and untarnished by politics. You know, last week, last week, you know, Council. Council. Dozen, uh, more than a dozen, uh, 16 Palestinian children were killed in you know, the attacks on, on Gaza. How do you ever expect that such horrible, ter terrifically horrible crimes ever investigated. How would you go about investigating such a thing? I mean, you know, the UN keeps saying, Michelle Bichelet issued a big statement last week. You guys, uh, you know, just were not there. 
Again, Saeed, our focus is on de-escalation. Uh, we want to see the conditions that undergird uh, the violence uh, that we've seen, including recently, uh, the rocket fire uh, from Gaza, and in turn... But really uh, have killed no one. I mean, you know, I'm not condoning in any way. You know, they are, they targeted probably civilian areas, but as a result, some were, were killed. These not are, like the Israeli attack that killed dozens of Palestinians, these are, civilians. These are indiscriminate uh, rocket fire from Gaza uh, that in, uh, over the course of recent months, and especially, uh, as you recall too well, uh, last May and June, uh, killed uh, civilians, certainly killed civilians, including children inside uh, Israel. Uh, of course, we don't want to see any civilians under threat, whether it's from terrorist atta attacks uh, or reprisals that are uh, done in the name of self-defense. That's why we focused on de-escalating uh, the situation uh, and finding a, a longer-term sustainable path uh, to create a no negotiated peace between the parties. I've gone on for far too long, so let me just take one more question. On this, uh, the the ship that was carrying grain, um, the inaugural ship that left Odessa um, under the UN broker deal, it's been spotted in Syria. Um, sources have told uh, Reuters, I believe, that they are unloading um, from the ship. Do you have any comment on that? Well, we're aware of reports that uh, the ship, the Rizzoni, uh, that its cargo was sold to another buyer uh, and that the ship is now in the vicinity of the Syrian port of Tartus. Uh, we, of course, don't determine who buys uh, the grain shipments or their final destinations. What matters uh, most to us are a couple, a couple things. One, uh, that Ukraine uh, is appropriately compensated uh, for the grain, the food stuff, for the crops uh, that uh, it is, in this case, providing, and that the food gets to where it is needed most. Uh, we continue to welcome the departure of vessels from uh, Ukraine's Black Sea ports, uh, allowing Ukraine's farmers to once again uh, supply the world with grain. Uh, this is uh, one ship of uh, more than 20 uh, that have left the Black Sea ports. Uh, the vast majority of those have cleared the inspection station uh, and are uh, en route to uh, ports uh, around the world. We want to see that continue. Just a little uh, on Russia. Abby? Um, I know this happened last week, but given you weren't at the podium, do you have any, um, how concerned is the U.S. about Russia suspending inspections as part of uh, the New START treaty, especially given that they haven't taken place since 2020 uh, due to COVID? Uh, so we are committed to implementation of the New START treaty. Uh, we have made the point that New START uh, and its place in the global nonproliferation regime uh, is just as important today and in some ways even more important uh, than it was uh, at uh, its signing. Uh, we have to work together to reduce the risk of an arms race uh, or nuclear escalation. Uh, we're keeping discussions between the parties concerning uh, treaty implementation uh, confidential. Uh, for our part, we had paused inspection activity uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic in the spring of 2020. Uh, nevertheless, both sides have continued to provide data declarations and notifications in accordance uh, with the treaty. U.S. sanctions and restrictive measures imposed as a result of Russia's war against Ukraine are fully compatible uh, with the New START treaty. They don't prevent Russian inspectors from conducting treaty inspections in the United States. Uh, and will continue to engage Russia on the resumption of inspections through uh, diplomatic uh, channels. Was that uh, my one last question? Uh, I, I had, you have not asked a question yet, so we'll Thank conclude you. there. Yeah. Um, Russia, to yes. uh, Vladimir Putin said today that the United States is trying to prolong the conflict in Ukraine, and he said, quote, uh, the United States operating in exactly the same way, full in potential for conflict in uh, Asia, Africa, and Latin America. And yesterday, he already mentioned other parts of the world, saying that uh, Russia is ready to sell advanced weapons to allies in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. So do you have a reaction on that affirmation? And uh, regarding Latin, Latin America, if this offer of selling uh, advanced weapons could interfere in the bilateral meeting that the United States have with um, Latin America countries that somehow um, support Russia. Well, the richness of President Putin's comments did not go unnoticed here, precisely because there's no country uh, that did more in uh, advance 
of Russia's uh, brutal invasion of Ukraine to try to prevent uh, the war. Uh, those of you who have traveled with us, those of you who've uh, consistently been here will recall that uh, going back to late last year and certainly earlier this year, uh, we went around the world uh, in an effort uh, to forestall uh, potential Russian aggression. Uh, we engaged uh, not only our partners and our allies at NATO and Kyiv, uh, but we also engaged uh, the Russians at high levels. Secretary Blinken uh, had a couple face-to-face -face meetings with Foreign Minister Lavrov. De Deputy Secretary Sherman had face-to-face -face meetings uh, with uh, Deputy Foreign Minister Lyapta, among others. We engaged at the OSCE, we engaged at the NATO, the then uh, NATO uh, Russia Council as well in an effort to see to it that a war like this uh, would, not, uh, would not happen. Of course, unfortunately, uh, we were not successful uh, in those efforts because President Putin was determined to go forward. Uh, and no one is responsible for uh, this invasion. Uh, no one is uh, responsible uh, for the war's continuation uh, beyond President Putin uh, and those in the Kremlin uh, who decided uh, to launch and to continue uh, this war. What we have done is uh, provide our Ukrainian partners with uh, the means they need to defend themselves, the means they need to defend uh, their sovereignty, their independence, uh, and their territorial integrity, and they've done that uh, to good effect. When it comes to uh, potential weapons purchases uh, and engagements with Russia's defense sector, uh, we've been clear that in the aftermath, especially of Russia's brutal invasion of Ukraine, it's premeditated, uh, unjustified invasion of Ukraine. Uh, we encourage countries around the world uh, not to engage with Russia's defense sector uh, because of not only the principle uh, of the matter, uh, but also because uh, of the sanctions uh, that the United States uh, has in place as do dozens of other countries around the world. Thank you all very much. Well, yesterday.